เอทังสันทังเอทังปนิทังยาดีดังสัพบสังขารสมาโตชาบูพัดฮีปฏินิสสโกทันหักขายโอวิรากุนิโรดโอนิบานัง This is peaceful. This is excellent, namely the stilling of all sankara, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, nirvana. Namaste. So, we've given the verse. E tang san tang. This is peaceful. A tang pani tang, this is excellent. Yadi dang, what is that? Namely, sabba sankara samato, the stilling of all sankara. And of course, the question is, what are sankara? <laughs> well, if you read the Buddhist literature, especially the suttas, which is highly recommended. You will find that the term sankara is translated a number of different ways by different translators: formations, fabrications, uh, preparations, <laughs> fermentations. All those translations are wrong. If you really look into how the Buddha uses the term. In the context, what it means is an ontic commitment. And what is that? The Greek word "ontos" means being, both phenomenal being in the ordinary world and absolute being in self-realization. So antos comes into our English language as antic, an adjective meaning having to do with or about being. And of course, a commitment is a promise, either to yourself or to someone else. So what is an antic commitment? It's a promise to be or become something. Now, the Buddha classifies these sankara. Sankara is singular. Sankara, the long a on the end, is plural. It's almost always used in the plural. But there's one place where Buddha uses it in the singular. Two places. One place is where he says there are bodily. Mental and verbal sankara. In other words, three basic types, and in another place he classifies them as sensual desires, dejection, meaning the failure to attain self-realization, bodily needs, as opposed to desires over and above the actual needs of the body. And finally, as cravings. So let's look into these a little bit, and then we'll go deeper into what a ontic commitment really is. <laughs> a sensual desire is a luxury; it's not required for the existence or health of the body or mind. It's something that we want, not that we need. And it's something basically concocted, or maybe an imitation of some others. It's not really coming from o u r s e l f It's a reflection or an imitation of something we see outside. So and so has a new car. Uh, such and such is dressed in a certain way, or so and so has been going to the gym, right? <laughs> so we want to imitate that. Because we think, oh, that will help me eliminate suffering. 
Then there are the bodily needs, food, water, sleep, shelter, clothing, so on like that. And these are legitimate sankara. These are things you have to have to take care of the body. Huh? Even though the body, <laughs> when you get deep in meditation, seems like some kind of pet animal that you have to take care of all the time. <laughs> the care of the body is essential because without it being in good condition, we can't do the work to attain self-realization. Okay. Then there are uh, cravings. Cravings are habits that we have built up through reinforcement over a long, long time. For example, the craving to be an individual. Or some people develop a drug habit. That's a craving. Or a food habit. Huh? The craving for certain types of food. But most of our cravings are psychological. We want to think that we have some prestige, uh, that our life has meaning, that we're important, that we're interesting. Uh, we have these psychological cravings. So if we look into it really deeply, uh, let's go to the next level now. Sankara are imaginary. For example, last time we talked about this body, that from an experiential point of view, from a subjective point of view, this body does not exist as a unit. It exists as perceptions, feelings about those perceptions, intentions, attentions, consciousness, and like that. As an aggregate, what is an aggregate? It's a bunch of things that we put together and then call them one, but they're actually separate. Uh, for example, uh, if I have uh, a bag and I fill it with coal, I say, I have a bag of coal. But do I really, what, what do I really have? I have a bag with a bunch of pieces of coal in it. The pieces of coal are the reality. Saying I have a bag of coal is an aggregate. Saying that I have a body, a body is an aggregate. The world, that's a good one, huh? The world is another aggregate. What is the world? It's a bunch of separate and disparate phenomena that occur due to nature and karma and so on. But we lump them all together and we put them under one name and call it the world. Uh, but it's actually not one thing. It's a bunch of separate processes that run in their own way, at their own time, in their own uh, scale also all the way from subatomic up to intergalactic. So to call all these, all these different things, one thing is imaginary. Another good example is a corporation. What is a corporation? Huh? Well, if you ask somebody, show me your company, he'll probably show you a building. Inside the building, there's offices or a factory and people working, machines and computers and stuff. Uh, this is our company. <laughs> but what is a company really? Well, the first thing you, you do when you start a company is file a fictitious name statement. It's a fiction. It's a fabrication. It's a lie. <laughs> it's an entity that doesn't really exist. Huh? like Harvey, the eight-foot-tall rabbit in that movie about Christmas. It's a fabrication. It's a sankara. A company, a country, a religion, 
a political party, a philosophy, and so many things that we think of as units are actually just a bunch of different things lumped together in an aggregate. So the Buddha makes good use of this concept of aggregates to deconstruct our imaginary items such as the body, the mind, the world, and so on, the person. Oh my God. So there are so many things that don't really exist that we, ex we make them exist, we call them into existence, or we imagine their existence through names. We give the thing a name, and then we manipulate it as a name, a name and form, uh, nama rupa. So then to desire those things, or to want to become or acquire those things, is a sankara. Is that clear now? What is a sankara? An antic commitment. I'm going to be, become, or acquire this thing. And this thing is usually <laughs> an aggregate, something that we imagine to be a unit, but is really a whole bunch of different things, a whole collection of stuff. Now, what is the problem with that? Well, in the uh, Paticca Samupada, the process of becoming, and you can look back in our early videos going all the way back to the Foundation series, and we talk about Paticca Samupada, dependent origination. It's another one of those things that's translated all kinds of different ways. I like to use the original term, Paticca Samupada, means conditioned arising. So, by this condition, this arises. When this condition stops, this also ceases. And I made the example of two ends of a stick. Huh? I, I always forget to get a stick. <laughs> but a stick has two ends. Uh, maybe you're holding the stick by one end, right? And then, the other, and then there's the far end of the stick. So, if you want to get rid of the far end of the stick, Huh? You throw the near end of the stick, and they both go. So, ignorance, because of ignorance as a condition, sankhara exists. Because of sankhara as a condition, conditioned consciousness exists, vijnana. Because vijnana exists, Nama Rupa, name and form, exist, and so on. These are all the causes of suffering. So if we want to eliminate suffering, which is a very good idea, <laughs> the best idea, I think, then we should go as high as possible in the chain of causes and eliminate them one by one systematically. And when we do that, all the other things that are dependent on them will disappear automatically. So if we eliminate ignorance, which we're trying to help you do right now, we're trying to help you eliminate your ignorance about Sankara. So if you eliminate your ignorance and you know about Sankara, then the natural thing will be to get rid of them huh? because they're imaginary, they're illusion. And they're also the cause of conditioned consciousness, which is suffering. So if you want to get rid of suffering, but you can't work with consciousness directly because it's software, you have to have a tool. What is that tool? Sankara nirodho. See, if we get rid of sankara, then conditioned consciousness will go automatically. So, how do we do that? I want to try to get to the 
the real point of this because I'm entering a phase where I may not want to speak for some time. <laughs> Eliminating my own sankara. When you sit in meditation, quiet the mind, look within. Many, many sankara are going to arise. Guaranteed. Especially the commitment, the ontic commitment to be an individual, to be I, to be a person, to be a self. Not the self with a capital S, but a self with a small s, an individual self, a person. So all the contents of the mind, if you look at it analytically, are sankara. And we have an, an enormous pile, a mountain of samsara, of uh, sankaras, excuse me. That's what forms samsara. How does it get started? Well, when we're young, we are suffering. Uh, maybe we're hungry. Oh, so let me form this sankara. I will eat. See, this is how it starts. I want to mitigate my suffering. So I make a determination. I form an intention to attain a certain type of being or a state of becoming into that being. And because of that, then at least I feel, uh, how can I say, compensated in some way for my suffering. Now, does creating a sankara actually stop the suffering? No. No, it doesn't affect the suffering at all. In fact, it increases the suffering. You know, the example would be if I have a thorn in my foot, then I take a, another thorn and stick it in my arm to, to get my mind off the one in my foot. So, to get my mind off the suffering, let's say, of being hungry, I create this tension. And what is the tension? To become full of food. <laughs> now, if you take this idea and you extend it, you can see that every time we are in any kind of suffering, we will try to create a sankara to counteract it. The problem is, sankara are imagination. They don't really do anything except maybe take our mind off of the suffering. Take our attention away from that which we don't want. See, But since the three kinds of ignorance are lust, means I want, hatred, which means I don't want, and delusion, which means I think I am somebody. <laughs> I think I'm an individual. All the sankara do is feed the ignorance. They increase the ignorance. So we want to get rid of these sankara. How do we do that? We have to see that they are empty that they're simply imaginary, that they don't really do anything at all, huh? like the pills that mother gives you. <laughs> they don't do anything at all. Ask Alice <laughs> when she's this tall. So what we want is to see through the sankara and see that the form of a sankara is only a desire. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really help anything. It's a tension. Huh? A tension between the way things are now and the way we want them to be in the future. That's what a desire is, isn't it? So it's a tension. It's a load of tension on the mind. And then finally, Sankara are void. Uh, 
they have no real value. Maybe just to distract us. Uh, so, so Sankara are imaginary. They don't really exist. They're only a desire, which is attention. And finally, they're void. They have no benefit, no function really at all. All they do is prop up the imaginary concept of I as an individual in the world and so on and so forth. And I'm running out of time. <laughs> so I don't know when I'll get around to doing another one of these. Um, but uh, you should, in your own work, look into yourself and find these sankara, and then hold them up to the light and see that they're actually insubstantial. They're nothing. Allow them to evaporate, and you'll feel so much better, so much lighter, and so much closer to your real enlightened nature. Aum Tatsat. Aum Harihi Aum.